¿Cómo estás? Bueno, en este video vas a ver una entrevista de la segunda vez que tuve el, el lujo de entrevistar a Aaron Ross, padre de toda esta disciplina de especializar ventas, trabajar más en procesos en lo que es eh, B2B. Eh, te aviso que si querés ver el webinar en español, este webinar fue doblado en vivo al español. Si querés verlo doblado al español, eh, hay un link acá en la descripción para que puedas ver el video en español. Um, y bueno, y el webinar un poco vamos a charlar de Predictable Revenue, si no lo leíste, de lo que son los conceptos generales. También vamos a hablar de qué cambió desde que escribió el libro eh, hasta el momento que hicimos la entrevista en 2021, ¿no? que fueron muchos años. Um, y después vamos a trabajar mucho sobre tercerización, coaching de CDR, y hacia dónde va un poco todo el, el mundo y cómo de CDR esto le impacta. Eh, nada, espero que, que lo disfrutes como yo disfruté haciendo la entrevista. So, um, now yes, welcome uh, Aaron, um, thanks for joining again, uh, this special opportunity of, of, of the book. Yeah, well, thanks for having me here. Well, okay. here, obviously, we're not in the same place, but you know what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> so what you told me is that you're living currently in Scotland and you are now in Los Angeles, so I, we had to wake you up a little bit today. Basically, well, uh, as you may know, or I have a lot of kids. We actually have 10 children, half are adopted, and there's always some child in crisis. It just rotates through different children. So right now we're here, I have a, a 16 year old son who has severe like, anxiety and depression. So he came to Los Angeles for basically to help him with that. So, so I'm in a different time zone. No, sorry? At why I'm on, yeah, very different time zone. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> than I expected. Um, but, but I do feel like it is, at least in the States, really common like anxiety and depression and mental health emotional health has just gone the challenges have gone so um through the roof here and i don't think they're really i think they're going to last even once the pandemic stops yeah 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 okay um so i don't um the i first i wanted to ask you so the good news here And I'm very happy for this, that it's predictable <laughs> revenue is in Spanish. Um, yes. This, finally, I remember finally. on the webinar in 2018 that you shared the, the, the word, the Google Doc with the, <laughs> with the book translated. Um, I mean, th this is huge because Latin America, we are going to increase the level of sales to, to you know, to, to have a little bit more processes uh, on sales. and. And so I'm very happy for that because we have a, a, in Latin America a lot to grow. But I wanted, you know, to know um, if there was a, about this book, if there was, were some differences, uh, because many people here read Predictable Revenue in English. So uh, in, in the version in Spanish, is there any difference? Yeah, it's, a, it's an updated edition as well. And I would assume lots of people here on the webinar have not read the book. And we could talk about some of the, the basic ideas, but um, there's a lot of small changes. There's some, a few bigger ones, like a new case study, but it, it's, a, it's an updated edition. It's very different than the one in English, also the way it looks, because we had a different mm -hmm. publisher and the, the formatting and the, obviously. So yeah, it's a, it's a new edition, new language. Uh, and again, it's been the years trying to get into Spanish. So finally got it out. Okay, so I have a, you know, previous to the webinar, I asked the people on the inscription form to ask what question do they have? So we have 46 questions, so that's, and we won't be able to make the 46 today, no. but <laughs> just, um, just my first question is like, um, I don't know if you could describe the model you pro you propose or or the history of this predictable revenue model, how it came for, for the people that haven't read it. Uh, yeah, what, what, what's the main idea there? Yeah, well, the book in short is about when I was at salesforce.com. And 
you know, my mini story is that uh, when I was, I think like 20, well, I'm probably like 30 years old, I'd started a business and it failed. Um, and, and shutting that down, you know, I realized, okay, if I'm going to be starting a business or being a CEO, I need to know how to build a sales team and how sales works. So I went to Salesforce to understand, basically to get my, uh, to go to sales school, right? To get a job in selling. So I knew how it worked. And so I went, from, and they, the only job they had was the most junior job, answering the phone. Like people who would go to the website and or put in a lead, but that's all I had. So I would say that's actually one piece of advice that I give out to people is if you need to, you know, if there's a job to be done or if you feel really you need to learn something, of course, a job is a great way to get paid to learn. And don't let, don't let your ego get in your way. So I'm from being the CEO of a venture-backed company. We'd raised $5 million to the most junior um, starting uh, entry-level sales job at the company. But through there, I saw that Salesforce.com had a, a problem. They were struggling to generate enough appointments, enough meetings for their senior salespeople, like the ones targeting big companies. And so I said, I volunteered to try to say, um, I know we have this problem and what we're doing is not working. So let me see if I can figure out something. And this is back in uh, the mid 2000s. When salesforce.com was, no one had, very few people had heard of them. There were maybe 150 people. And I created a um, sales system to reach out through cold email primarily, but also cold calling to reach out to companies and get as many appointments as we needed. So we could get, fill the, the funnel or fill the pipeline for the senior salespeople. And the book is a lot about that. Um, why I did it, how it worked, and other like, um, sales approaches like sales management and like how to create predictable revenue. Uh, so, they, so they call it the sales Bible for Silicon Valley. Now let's say one, one key idea, I think this is actually the most fundamental idea of the book is, is the idea of sales specialization. In fact, uh, I'll throw up, have, I may have a picture I'll throw up just for this. As you show the picture, just uh, a los que se suman recién, la interpretación, hay un botón abajo, interpretación. Ahí pueden escuchar la interpretación. Sorry, Aaron. Yeah. Oh, so I mentioned, yeah, big family. We have 10 children and <laughs> uh, half are adopted. We actually don't have a picture with every child in it at the same time. Okay. So this, there's two pictures here I want to share. Think about any sports team, any football team. There's no team where the coach tells all the players, okay, everybody, I want everyone to attack and then everyone to defend. It's crazy. They would lose everything. No, you've got specialists, attackers, midfield, defenders, goalie. And the same thing is in sales. So one, now the roles may be different, but fundamentally there's four roles that are pretty common through B2B companies, like business to, when you have salespeople. There's the, the job where if you have inbound leads, someone to respond to them, like a junior salespeople, a junior salesperson who's focused on making sure every inbound lead gets responded to. Right. So the sense for inbound, there's outbound, right? Outbound prospecting, cold calling, email, LinkedIn, knocking on doors, or whatever it takes to go get meetings. And both of those jobs tend to be more junior and they're both setting appointments for salespeople, right? Who are sending up new customers. And once customers basically are signed, they get passed to customer success or account management or other people who handle customers. Now, these roles can change based on your business, but 
the idea again, like a sports team, that you have everyone does a more specific job better and they do it as a team. So why don't I stop the share? There we go. Okay. And that, that's actually the most important idea in the book. And that idea makes it possible for people to do outbound prospecting well. Right? Uh, and that idea actually today and in the future, it needs to be, uh, it's even more important as the world gets more confusing and busy. Right? I don't know about you, but um, I and lots of people are feeling this just pandemic kind of overwhelm and and in the United States, it called the great resistance, which is everyone just feels like, bleh, like the drag, like, like low on energy. And so one thing that's important is to try to again, have your people or for you focus on doing fewer things better. That's, that's one part of, uh, and that's the future of work is more specialization. Right? not trying to do everything yourself because you can't you can't do it well yeah um, why um so I, I read the book and I, I i know why but I, let me ask you why the word uh, the word predictable well that actually came like when i was in in sales at predictable revenue and uh, at salesforce.com i didn't want to know it's, and then the hotel person will buy. <laughs> I didn't want to know uh, next month, like, am I going to hit my number? I didn't want to scramble month to month. Like, I wanted some predictability. And the first version of the book was called, uh, my first blog was called Build a Sales Machine. Not bad, but, you know, Predictable, re but what I wanted was predictable revenue. And that's what people want. And a lot of that, um, if we go back, people, humans are, are safety seeking creatures. Like we want safety. Mm -hmm. And it feels very unsafe if we don't know how we're going to make our numbers or pay the rent or hit our goals over the next few months or years. Unfortunately, the way the world's changing, there's less predictability, there's less safety so we need more confidence that no matter what comes our way we're going to be able to tackle the challenge and find a solution okay um so um the the other question is as you had you know since you published the book then you created your your company where you make consultancy on this methodology you outsource uh, SDR teams. Um, do you have a metric of when people apply this methodology of specialization, how much the sales increase on average or the meetings? Yeah. Um, I don't have a, like a measure, but mm -hmm. what I can say is there are a lot of people who okay. said once they did the specialization, including and creating an outbound, like the, the prospecting job, like the inbound lead response and the outbound prospecting. A lot of people say their, their results doubled. Yeah. But that's what just they say. They say it transformed my sales team. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're, they're significant, but I don't have data. From my personal experience, um, when I was prospecting and doing sales, prospecting was the 50% of my time. So if we do, in my case, if I would have a, an SDR making me the meetings, I would have that of 50% selling, you know? So it makes sense to double the sales. Um, so, so, so yeah, and you know, something I discovered when applying the methodology uh, of predictable revenue uh, on album was that the, you have, a better way to uh, engage with top performers, to, with top sellers, to, with top account executives, because now we are saying to them, your job is just to sell and you will get more commissions. I don't know if you, you have any experience with that as well. 
yeah, it makes their job so much better because like, mm -hmm. they can enjoy, like most salespeople do not like the prospect and they're not good at it. There are some who are good at it. And I think even fewer that like to do it because, and we're talking about, there's two, there's at least two kinds of prospecting. There's one kind of prospecting where you're reaching out to your friends and your network. Okay, that's something that actually those salespeople should still do. The other type is cold calling, cold emailing, cold LinkedIn, and it's it's very laborious. It's you need someone who's really good at it and can focus on it to do well. And salespeople who do it part time just are not going to be good. It's very very hard to be good at it part time to get results that way. So I say like salespeople should prospect a little bit, focused on their rela building relationships, current relationship. Uh, current people that know current relationships or creating new ones that are important and kind of everything else should be done by a junior person who's a partner to them and they work together so again even more important than ever today because with everyone and i think this is like there's just more with remote work um, and more screen time there's more loneliness there's more depression there's more uncertainty and so also having people like a team, the people you can work with in person is better, but even if it's remote, but like people like a team in, in very important to maintain the energy of the salespeople of anybody. Yeah. Um, you said something and I have a question. Then I will start reading the question. Sorry, the, the audience that I still haven't read the questions, but just one is that you said about this partner, do you recommend or or depends on the case sdrs having like an account executive as as pair like doing like couples or like sdrs booking to every ae so very important you mentioned that relationship between the sdr right so the word sdr i use the term inbound sdr right because there's one job for they're just responding to inbound leads if you have them. Some people don't. And outbound SDR, which means they're primarily prospecting. Those are two different jobs. If you only have one SDR, they have to juggle. But as soon as you get two SDRs, if you have inbound leads, you just need to think about separating them from that job. But the relationship between the SDRs, especially the outbound SDRs, but both types, and the salespeople is very important. It's very important. They know each other. They know how each other works. They know which accounts they're working on. And so if, a, if an SDR is an outbound SDR or an outbound prospector is supporting more than four or five salespeople, they just, they get too scattered. So they need a, a certain number of, of salespeople to partner with one like one SDR to one salesperson or two or three maybe four and no more than that so build that relationship and the focus right right so um as i said i have uh, 50 questions <laughs> i don't remember how many i the top question that uh, people wanted to know for this webinar is how uh, did it change uh, what, what 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 do you think are the main changes since you published the book until now, and I imagine especially since pandemic. Yeah. Um, well, there's really one, one main trend that's driving changes. And this trend is just more technology. But what this means is, so there's, there's technology is easier to create. So there's more apps, applications. There's more um, channels. There's more applications sending more messages. And all this means there's more overwhelm and more noise. So if I'm a buyer, I'm getting more emails. I might be getting more phone calls or more LinkedIn. I might at some point start getting WhatsApps. And just like my, my mental energy for being able to look at everything, it's just getting smaller. So my attention maybe in the past was this big. And now it's just getting like this for each message. And generally buyer, I'm like, I'm more tired, I'm more stressed. 
I just don't want to, it's kind of, it's, so it's harder to connect with them. It's harder for them to see your information, to kind of cut through the noise and to connect with the buyer. That's, that's a, the, the world change. Now what that means for a prospector, um, again, there's like, for prospectors, there's more technology sending more messages. So I need to be more uh, focused on targeting fewer accounts and being more insightful to those types of industries or accounts. So I need to be uh, more knowledgeable about the business I'm in and who my buyers are. I need to be able to practice empathy to be able to understand kind of what's it like to be in the shoes of my buyer. What kinds of thoughts do they think or what feelings do they feel so that I can understand like what would I say or what would I write that they would care about? Outbound prospecting still works, but you just have to be better at it. And you, what doesn't work is just sending more email. You know, our, my emails aren't getting a high response. I better send more. No, it usually says, okay, stop, go back to the beginning. Who's your customer? What are their problems? What do they care about? How can you connect to them in their language about things they care about? That's, that's the main change. So the techniques, there are new ones like now, LinkedIn is very popular, although again, very busy. There's technology like um, sales engagement tools to automate a lot of the follow-up. So there's, there's changes that way, but really the thing that matters is the, the overwhelm and the complexity for the buyers and also for the salespeople. So that creates a need to help them be more focused in their job. So let me, uh, if I understood properly, but I think uh, one of the main, the strong points for for breaking through the noise, it's uh, the message. The, the way you communicate and this short and sweet that you say on predictable revenue gets more relevance. Yeah, so generally you want, uh, so think about it, short messages, whether it's on email or LinkedIn or the phone, get better response rates than long ones. And one of the tips in the book is if you're, sending an email, don't put, don't send something that takes more than one thumb swipe. So it should fit, you know, probably about that big. Because if, if you think about it, notice yourselves, when you get a long email, your reaction is like, oh, am I gonna read all this? So that's just because a short email seems, feels easier to read alone when people will read more, read it more. And then it forces, salespeople to be more concise, to write better. Because honestly, most salespeople don't write very well. We're just lazy because we want to, we're afraid. So we put in too much information because we're afraid we're gonna miss something, which means if I just add one more point, maybe that's the thing that will interest them. And then the email gets too long, the proposal gets too long, and it's not readable and they people don't enjoy it so you have to keep it as short and relevant then as possible i'll i'll give you yeah. i'll uh i'll give you a couple like really simple practical tips so before you send and this could this isn't this is for anything you do like before you send a, an email or and it could be a proposal or if you write a book read it out loud Right. Reading out loud will help you catch awkward awkwardness. And also the simple thing is send your email or message to yourself and look at it on your laptop and look at it on your phone. You know, did, did make sure it looks, how does it look to you? If you were going to receive it, does it look fine? Does it look weird? Like those are two simple things that can really help you catch um, obvious errors. One thing that I always, uh, when I was managing this DRO team, there were two things. One was the you, me ratio. So how many times you say you and you say me? Because I don't know what you think, but you receive many emails like, 
my company does this, my, 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 and all the email, you could just say, hey, can I help you with this? Are you having this? And I, I think, uh, I, I don't know if you see something similar on, on the messaging on the Yumi ratio. Yeah, I mean, I think in principle, it just means that it, like a lot, of a lot of people write an email, which is really about them. And that they don't first, and which is okay, but first you need something about who you're writing it to. Because so many people write an email just saying, hey, do you need website design? And I don't like knowing, I mean, people are too busy to care unless you give them something they, they're interested in. So typically a really simple email format is three parts. Like the first part, and this could be one sentence. Like, why are you reaching out? Like, I saw you on LinkedIn or I did this and this here's why I'm sending this message. Uh, and the second part is like a, a, a value. Right? Here's something, a result we've created for other people or here's why we were useful. It's not that we, we can help your website, it's that we can, you know, with other companies like yours, we've helped increase their website conversions. So it's kind of like a, a value statement. And the last step is a call to action. What are you asking them to do? And one mistake that people make too is you really want, again, a call to action that's easy for them to respond to. So yes, should you ask for an appointment? Yes. If they don't respond to that, would it be easy? Give them an easier ask, like, okay, give them a question. If you're selling to, if you sell a sales tool, it could be a simple question like, how many sales people do you have? So just, you're trying to make the, email easy to understand and simple to act on or simple to understand and easy to act on and if you just use that uh, mantra simple uh, simple to understand easy to act on from the customer's view that will help you get better response rates so read it does it make sense it's hard it's it's hard to read your own thing. And it's hard mm -hmm. to get your, honestly, the, if you sell to CFOs and you know one or you have one in your company, try to get them to look at your email for you. Yeah. So one of the, one of the problems, we, we get feedback from people we know and in, in our team because it's easy, but they usually don't give us good feedback because they, they know us too well. Yeah. Yeah. And also what you mentioned on, I want to add these that maybe they don't know. You know, it's like you, you have a sequence maybe later. I, I, I always thought you saying, okay, we have a buyer persona, we have one main pain, but then there are two more pains. Okay, second email because you're overwhelmed with, with information, if not like, okay, uh, it's a <laughs> too, too many news for me, you know, like, yeah. Okay, so, bueno, espero que hasta acá estés disfrutando este webinar con Aaron Ross. Eh, hasta ahora, bueno, como viste, vimos conceptos generales de Predictable Revenue, de su libro y cómo esto se fue cambiando estos 10 años. Todo el tema de la personalización es muy interesante. Ahora, quédate que lo que vamos a ver es todo lo que tiene que ver con tercerizar o no la función de CDR. Todo el, lo que después habla en su otro libro de elegir un nicho y profundizar en un nicho como, como empresa y qué beneficios eso te puede traer. Contratación, entrenamiento y coaching a los SDRs y cómo funciona ahora esto que es remoto. Eh, al final vas a ver que hay una pregunta súper interesante de qué es lo que va a ser en los próximos 5 o 10 años y la respuesta de Aaron a mí me encantó porque es de otro nivel para mí. Este, bueno, si estás disfrutando este webinar te aviso también que podés suscribirte a mi canal de YouTube, Primera Reunión, eh, por acá abajo hay un botón para suscribirte. Y también este, puedes conocer mi sitio, primerareunión.com, donde ahí publico todo este tipo de contenido, entrevistando no solo a Ron Ross, sino a líderes latinoamericanos que están haciendo esto en su, su día a día. Bueno, sigamos viendo, no te molesto más. I will turn left because I have my questions here. Um, one, of the, um, one of the questions from the people was, uh, from Juan Pablo, what do you think of outsourcing uh, lead generation, demand generation? Um, whether it's for sales or software, I think it can work sometimes really well, 
but it's challenging. You know, it's very, um, if you think all you have to do is find someone to write a check and you're done, it's not gonna work. Um, I'm trying to hire a, an executive assistant right now. And the, my challenge is I just, it takes a lot of work to find someone who's good and then to kind of get them ramped up. So I need to be able to put the time in to really work with them a lot to ramp them up. And the same is with any outsourcing, whether it's software or sales. So is it, I usually say, if you're an executive and you just don't have the energy or the experience to hire your own sales person or sales manager, or maybe you don't have the budget, um, because that's really probably more energy and time and experience. You should look at outsourcing. Um, if you have the desire and energy and time to hire a salesperson or people and do it yourself, um, that's usually the best way to go. But again, it takes, you have to be ready to work with them for, for months either way. And like outsourcing companies love to make great promises um, because, you know, they're selling. So you just have to, it's gonna, it takes months to get, probably think four to six months, no matter what you do to get an outbound uh, team or function up and running and producing quality results. There's no shortcut that I know of, unless you get lucky. Okay. Um... One other question from Nicolas. It's um, top three of things, the, the non-negotiable things you have to do when I want prospecting. I say, these three things, if you don't do it good, you won't succeed. Um, so one, there is, there's one section that is not in this book that was in a, the sequel. There's a sequel called, in English, From Impossible to Inevitable. This book is not in Spanish yet. Um, although, Andre, I'd be happy to give you the nail in each chapter. Maybe someone can translate that chapter at least. But this topic the first is called chapter. Nail. Yeah, it's called Nail in Yeah. Okay. I can put it on my blog. Yeah, yeah, you could I'm happy to do that. Okay. Uh, there's a publisher. So if, if I owned, uh, I don't own the book. So they, but the chapter I can share. So the first, um, is really the, the idea is you really need to understand the types of customers that need you and how they're different from the ones where you're a nice to have, right? Easiest time, way to waste time, your time, customer's time is targeting companies that are not, not that don't need you. So that's, that's the step one, like who needs you and why? What type of company, industry, person, buyer, like that is a step one, non-negotiable. Number two, if you have, um, let's say you have your own prospector, I think just spending enough time with them, like first, like hiring the best person you can get. If, if it's a new program for you, spend more money to get someone with a little bit more experience, like a better person who's more independent, more of an entrepreneur type, hmm. type. The mentality, um, because if you hire someone who's really inexperienced and cheap, but you need to tell them what to do all the time, it's just going to exhaust you. So, yes, you're not making money with it yet. There's this fear that on, that we get. I'm not making money with it yet, so I can't spend money on it yet. Don't don't get caught in that fear. I'm not making money with it yet, so I need to spend. I need to invest what I need to invest whether that's time or money to make it work sooner. Like, oh, um, just make sure that you are prepared to do what you need to do. Um, so I think the, the mistake, the non-negotiable, the mistake is, let's say like dabbling, like expecting great results, but only dabble, the word in dabbling, like, I'm experimenting. I'm just going to hire an intern to see if mm. this works. I'm just going to hire like a really cheap person or I'll, I'll spend like an hour a week on it. I'll dabble. And yeah, you don't, you're not going to get results. You need to, if you really need to make this work, you need to 
put your whole heart into it like anything else i don't know if that was two things or three but i feel like those are some non-negotiables okay. <laughs> that maybe are two non-negotiables it's okay <laughs> The other I I I I like from myself like myself is the message like you know, like it's the, because uh, th there are many questions based on this on uh, I don't receive uh, too much replies uh, my emails get to spam you know um, yeah so for that by the yeah. way the nail in the nail in niche yeah. idea again uh, going back to you're probably writing emails that are, aren't, aren't relevant or interesting. So who are your best buyers? What do they care about? You, honestly, go talk, go interview three of them. You don't need to do 20, go talk to three of those types of buyers and understand like, what are you dealing with? Like, what do you think, do you care about this? Um, and go talk to customers. It's, it's again, if you're, if you're really struggling with marketing, so with marketing in general, Best thing to do is to have your, if you're a CEO or head of marketing, go, go talk to a few customers. Like, like it never hurts. We don't go out and just talk to people enough. Mm -hmm. This is one of the, the, the changes in the world is that everything is, has to be like scheduled and sold. And you know what, just go talk to a customer and kind of you, to learn without an agenda to sell them something, but just kind of go learn and talk to them. Like do three of those and that will give you a lot more insights into what kinds of like emails or techniques or messages like what do they care about these days it's everything's changing faster so whatever worked last year may not work right now yeah. that's also a very good tip for account executives because yep. um it's on, on on this book from mark roberts who was on your your last event or your on your world um on his book he talks a lot of doing a ramp up in his case of from aes and half of the time, it's uh, learning about the how how their prospects do the job. Yeah. And yeah. my question here, and Chas Facundo also asked, so I will do a merge of both questions. It's um, what's a normal ramp up period for a junior album SDR? And my add-on question is, what kind of content do you think it's uh, the content that we should uh, give this uh, SDR to ramp up? Um, yeah, it's probably at least a couple months to ramp someone. Now, if you hire someone who's, who's had the job before, obviously it's different. They still need time to know the industry. So maybe it's a month. If it's someone who's brand new, who hasn't done sales, two to three months, um, depending on seniority and such, um, it's not 30 days. So you have to make sure you give them some time. Really, if it's a good person that you, you if after 30 days, you should know, do you believe in them? And so you need, um, again, it's kind of like the, the industry and about the industry and the buyers, so they know how the business works. I so say they should meet everyone, like at least meet different people throughout the company. So you, they know how your company works, whether they can visit in person or their Zoom calls, talk to someone in engineering, talk to someone in support, talk to someone in marketing partners, sales. So they have a, a broader picture of just how the company, how your own company works. Because they're trying to understand, um, you know, again, who are we selling to? And what are we doing? And so I, I think the fat, the thing that helps them ramp the fastest in any employee, is just more conversations. Like the more they can listen to, especially conversations with customers, like a support conversation, a sales conversation, the more they can have their own conversations and with your own people or customers. If that's the thing that really helps speed up the ramp. And otherwise it's, I am pretty simple. It's like, who's the customer? What do they need? What do you do? Um, and then there's a lot of uh, like SDR tactics. I think people really focus on, of course it's important how you write an email, but just as important or more important is organization. How can you help the SDR stay organized and learn how they can get a system to know, okay, which accounts should I be working on when? Yeah. And how much of what should I do every day? Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. The, so yeah, it's, um, you know, every, and everybody's different. I say like, there's a million cookbooks. 
but just because there's a million cookbooks doesn't mean there's a, you're going to find the cookbook that works right for you exactly from day one. You kind of find your own system. There's a lot of information around what SDRs should do. Hopefully you need to, you can find those and look at them, but you still need to be willing to, especially if it's new to you, hire someone and with yourself and them kind of work through, hey, let's try this. Let's kind of find our way through what system works for us. The kind of technology, the message, the market. Um, do we do mostly LinkedIn and a little bit of email calls? Is it mostly phone calls? Again, there's no single system that works for everyone. Um, so again, some people, some teams do better with lots of phone calls because their market does. Some people don't. So you have to be understand you have to kind of find your own way through all this overwhelming sort of information to your to get your own system in place. And you know, I, I really like what you say of listening or to see the conversations with, with clients. And that's something that is very simple to do. We did it a lot that that it's with a spreadsheet, we recorded the calls and we said, put your best, we selected the best calls. We, we, we went and said, okay, if you don't know which they are, you say, okay, look the ones at book meeting on your CRM or the same with the emails. So you can do it as a manager. Uh, and that's something like a, a Google Doc, uh, a spreadsheet, and, and it's amazing, yeah? Yeah, or I uh, said even having re recorded calls, whether it's sales calls, support calls with customers, mm -hmm. or, you know, like ones you could use those in training. I think like listening to people, hear people, like reading is important, yeah. but it's, it doesn't uh get you the same learning is when you read and then you apply it by listening to someone and then by having your own call mm -hmm. so it's just a start and uh you know again when people are remote we there's a certain amount of human interaction they need like not too much not, not too little but not too much because zoom you know mm -hmm. it's tiring so you're trying to find the right balance there to help them find the right balance on their kind of how many hours they should work over like we have this weird world where a lot of people won't go back to offices and they need to find their own structure at home. You know, it's, yeah. it's hard for lots of people, especially if they're newer. So, you know, that you have to understand you're, you need to help them if they're newer, because a lot of SDRs are kind of new to work, new to jobs, new to sales, realize that they may, you, you're, you're there to help them find their own rhythm as well in the actual job. And, and also in their, the way they manage themselves at home or, or don't. That's a pretty good advice because especially with SDR, it's, I don't know, I never thought about it, but maybe it's the first job they have. Um, yeah, a lot of them, a lot. And, and they don't have a, someone in person, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of challenges. In fact, I'm, I'm talking to a company potentially about, it's a different company, um, I'm actually in the process of leaving the predictable revenue company because I've kind of, and I'm really developing some new ideas around, again, exec, you know, on just kind of executives and how they can, um, why do they feel like their energy is dragging, including their sales energy, but also just their own personal energy. And how do you keep them feeling a bit more excited about work and excited about growing their company? So it's like working on some, boards of directors and um, one of the a company I'm look, talking to helping is helps to, with uh, SDR recruiting and training and stuff because I think it's a change with this job is that it's hard to find it's just hard to do it remotely hiring people and managing them and expecting them to do well and so there's a, a lot of and the remote work is going to stay some portion is always going to stay so there's a whole new set of challenges on dealing with people in remote teams and, and SDRs. So I think if you can, if you can, if you're working remotely, if you can find someone who's been an SDR before, great. That would be, spend more money to get someone who's done it before. Um, it's, it's just, it's so hard to get someone who's new if they're working remotely to, and to figure out the system. It, it's, it's really hard. So one message I think is don't be afraid to spend the money and the time, even if you're scared of spending money. If you be, if you feel like this is important to you, it's important to figure out, like over invest in the time and money and, and trust and know that it will return itself faster 
that if you try to spend less and kind of like baby step at that point, at the point you're ready to do this, baby steps are great at other times where you're kind of learning and kind of getting your plan in place. But when you know what you need to do, just go for it. Um, um, how do you think you, uh, a manager should start structure the coaching, especially now that it's all remote of this SDR? Because they can listen them. No, they are not in the office. So yeah, or they, they can give immediate support. So what, what, what do you think are a good structure of coaching there? Um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of tools today that you, know, you can, I mean, the, in the, the kind of the ballroom area of the hotel. So they're doing some cleanup after they party last night. I if you hear all the crashing, mm -hmm. but it was like bang crashing. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I got up oh, and I'm wearing my, my, my PJs here. Got up. Yeah. And, and that, so, that's the good thing of the pandemic. <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, with call coaching, it's harder. Like it's one thing that is such an advantage when you're in person in an office and you can see people. But you know, and some people will be able to do that in the future and some people won't. So it is harder. But you know, joint joint when you can doing joint phone calls. If you're good at listening to recordings, there's a lot of tools that are available to try to help bridge that gap to do calls together or to coach. Um, there's a lot of the chorus AI, um, Gong, there might be something oh. local to Latin America that help. They, and they're a lot of their values trying to help it easier, it easier to go through recording and find the places that are interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, what what I did a lot more with the is and it worked a lot. It's just recording the call on Google Meet and having the share folder of the recorded meet, meetings. So you as a, I did that as a manager, choose one random, uh, and then we we hire go, and you know it, it's much easier. But those one on ones, in my case, were very powerful because it was like it was a change of attitude, like immediately and. It was the, the trigger. And then you have the tools that you can do crazy stuff like the gong, but yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, you don't need, it doesn't have to be fancy. Uh, yeah, like, they're, they're like maybe I, I guess with there's so many tools, we get so overwhelmed, but sometimes some things we- I told you, I know, yeah. going back to the beginning, yeah. I'm thinking overwhelm, that's a real thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Choice so, paralysis. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, choice paralysis. Yeah, that's it. Andre, I, I, yeah. Yeah. Do you have Do you have kids, Andre? No, I don't. No, I'm wondering because yeah. I know in the states and <clears throat> in Europe, in UK, but I wonder. I would, and I don't know about Brazil as much, but I, I wonder if the thing with teenagers, there's in this, in that teenagers, the anxiety in teenagers is just going up and up and up, and a lot of it is because of this overwhelm. Right? With the internet, you can there's everyone doing everything. And there's just, and they're all doing it really well. And like, what do I do? Um, it's kind of like, and executives see this too. There's all these apps. I was like, what do I do? Um, but I think teenagers tend to, they, they haven't grown up their like emotional foundation yet. And so it's really bad. It's really challenging. Um, I'm kind of, I'm scared for the next you know, generations. I don't think that's going to go away in terms of the, dealing with technology at a young age and there's not really ways to control it and all the like anxiety uncertainty that it's creating so same thing for executives it's just a bit different but it's, i feel like yeah. that's the next economy is the anxiety economy for people who are dealing yeah. with anxiety yeah I, I think sometimes that we um, there is a new world always changing that it's very hard to to make the interpretation for us that we are like starting, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's start to say like, we're getting, we're starting to get more old and these people is creating their new world. Um, because I, I remember, well, may, maybe it's not the focus of the call, but I remember, you know, from my parents, my grandparents, they say, hey, your, your generation, you know, I don't know how can you do this? And they were very concerned as well. So it's like, I'm, I try to be optimistic always <laughs> with that. Yeah. Well, I'm optimistic. I am optimistic, yeah. but yeah. and scared at the same time because yeah. I have lots of you know with all my kids. I and again, yeah. I'm the reason I'm here in Los Angeles 
is because yeah. I have one that's suffering from severe anxiety and depression. Yeah. And so I, I, I see it firsthand too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I will go back to <laughs> to prospecting uh, questions and <laughs> more boring, you know. Um, so <laughs> true, um, true. More boring. Yeah. That's <laughs> then we say co coffee with Aaron Ross, and we all do a Zoom together, and we talk about life. Mm. Yeah, um, but it's very interesting. So um, Ignacio says. Um, should you hire this is a good question you should hire one sdr to start or you hire two i have a reply but I yes. want to in yours. if you can do two if, if you do something new better to start with two yeah if you can afford it even even if you are if they can be part-time yeah yeah well if it's one full-time person versus two part-time i would get one person who's better full-time I mean, everyone's different. What you're trying to do is get like the best person you can get. And I mean, I could, I could see if you have two great people that work together, it just, it's a lot, I think it's, um, but if you, if you can get two people who are, can be really focused on it, that's better than one because they get that buddy system. Yeah. If it's working or not working, you get to see like you learn more faster. Plus, they can they can support each other. It's a very lonely job at the beginning, especially. So it's it's a hard job. So having a, a a friend in it with them makes it easier just by having someone there who's doing the same job. Yeah. When we implemented this first time, well, if if you're you know, if your legislation allows it in Latin America, we we use uh, websites of free freelancers at the beginning, so we could hire part time easily and fast. We did the process first, but we put some people to do it, and they did best than the managers that we were doing the process just to draw the process. And it also helped us because we knew which was the performance. Yeah, you have to so. So yeah, this body system for me is is the best. Also, like <laughs> I wanted to make my opinion there, but it's very powerful that for me. Um, uh, so um, okay, we we have five minutes left. Uh, sorry, I have a lot of questions that I, we couldn't answer. Um, so my last question I was a question from the audience was, what do you see on the future? not only for the new generations, but also for prospecting, uh, which can be the, um, the trends you, you think will be important of prospecting. Yeah, well, I think there's part of it's obvious and there should be more noise. So you need to be more targeted, more relevant, more of the same. Right? There's more apps sending more email, more LinkedIn, so that's not going to change. You just have to get better. Um, you know, I, one of the things I'm working on is it is different. Like it's the idea to, around outbound, but not using cold email. So uh, we'll have to, have to see how that goes. And I'm not sure when I'll, I'll do it. Um, the world's just going to get noisier. So I think that what I see, what I'm focused on is how to bring more of a, that human element, human energy, sales energies, like how do you keep people's um, excitement up? How do you help them feel good about work? And so that they feel better and more energized to be better at their jobs. And sales and sales people, sales, they're dragging. It's just working, trying to work the same job remotely and the world's changing. It's just, uh, it's just not, I don't feel like I feel like something has to change for like our humanity to be to just for our basic humanity and to be able to make money and get results. Like the way we're doing it, and I just feel like it's over time, it's it's not going to work. Like the forty hours, uh, just kind of grinding through. It has it's it's going to continue to the effectiveness is going to go down. We need a new way to think about how people should be working at work, which the pandemic. It's created a big opportunity, right? We're kind of able to relook at how work should work 
like throw away or all the old patterns and habits around like nine to five, five days a week in an office. And for some people that's great, but other people it's not. And we can kind of, it's confusing because we have this blank sheet of paper, like how do we want to work? I don't know. Like we got to try stuff. Like I don't know. So it's confusing, but it'll end up being a much better for our, our people, which means it'll be much better for them to be able to be effective and adapt to the changes that are coming. So I, I really feel like because of the future, we, the executives especially need to be even they double down on understanding who their employees are, how they're doing personally, professionally, what they need and how you can, as a company, kind of change things around to support them emotionally too. Like it's uh, really emotionally because that's an energetically, so they feel like they um, aren't exhausted at work. So I think that is actually, that's what I'm most focused on right now. Right. right. Okay. So, uh, thanks a lot. This was amazing. This 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 webinar is the one the, the ones I most enjoyed. You know, uh, primera reunión. Um, so I don't know if if they want to follow you or you know contact you. Which is the best social network? Or yeah. Yeah, and uh, on LinkedIn, I can put my link. Up. It's probably pretty easy to find. I'm actually I'll put yeah. it up here. Um, LinkedIn is the best for right now. I'm going to have a newsletter in English soon, which I haven't had for a while. Uh, it won't be so much about outbound, by the way, let me know. Nice. But let me, let me flash this up on the screen. And my email address, I'll share that too if people want to reach out. I speak a little bit of Spanish. Okay. Um, I don't, but, and I, there is a company that I know of, um, humanfunnel.es out of Spain that is doing some uh, of this stuff in Spanish. So if you're interested, and Andre, you, I'm sure you probably know people, but um, this is the best way to get a hold of me or follow me. And mm -hmm. I would say if you do speak English, sorry, one more, is that that impossible book, oops, is, uh, no is also really important. I'll put this down. It's not in Spanish. I don't know if and when it'll get into Spanish from impossible.com. Yeah is a url for the seat this is the sequel to predictable revenue it's got that nail a niche section which you know andre if i, if I haven't sent that i'll send that to you you can yeah. translate it or no, do I, what you will with it yeah i have it in paper look i have it here but the, um this one yeah i have it in english um what i like from this book from my opinion as a reader is it's like a general structure of all the sales machine. You did with Jason Blenkin, that is from Saster. So if you have a SaaS company, it's it's amazing for for that. And I really I really like it that because you give strategies on on each each channel. You talk a little bit also about inbound, and it's more. Uh, and obviously, outbound is like your I guess your main specialty, <laughs> but. But uh, you 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 see all the acquisition channels and the yep. strategies and hiring uh, and and it's, it's pretty good. Yeah. Yep. I I think the here is when you say about the manager according to the size of your company. Like say the yes. one if you have a company is a dashboard manager. I remember that concept. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the the nature of your executives and leaders should change as your company gets bigger. You need different people. Yeah. yeah different types of people at different stages. I always recall it because of, of my role. It's like the company also is starting to get bigger. Now we, we've got acquired. And I was always thinking, hey, how my mentality should be as a manager. And, and I recall that, that it's pre pretty good to have a good uh, perception. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> so, um, so, well, I don't Thanks a lot. Hope you enjoy a lot. Your, well, your, you can spend a lot of time now with, with, with your son. Uh, so, well. Thank you, and I guess all the audience here is pretty happy with your with your talk today. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Andre, for setting this up, and thanks everyone. Good to meet you. Okay. <laughs> Buenos dias. Buenos dias. <laughs> chao, chao. Bueno, espero que hayas disfrutado mucho de este webinar. Eh, yo particularmente disfruté mucho y de tener el privilegio de entrevistar por segunda vez a, a Aaron. Este, que es el padre ¿no? de toda esta ciencia, de, de, de ponerle un poco de procesos a las ventas y especializar 
eh, las funciones. Eh, si te gusta este tipo de contenido, si te gusta todo lo que es ventas B2B, eh, te invito a que visites, bueno, que te suscribas al canal, por un lado, eh, y ahí vas a poder recibir notificaciones cuando publico un video. Pero también eh, en mi sitio primerareunión.com también publico contenido, publico estos webinars, a veces escribo un artículo. Este, y ahí te vas a enterar también cuando sea el próximo webinar. Eh, así que nada, te, te espero en un próximo video y bueno, quédate acá al final que te voy a sugerir otros videos para, para que veas.